Donald Trump's defense files a motion to dismiss for selective and vindictive prosecution, saying that Joe Biden and the DOJ have been orchestrating an attack on their political opponent. And you can't do that. You got to prosecute according to the law and according to the principles of justice, not because you want to try to remove your opponent from the board. And this came a part of a mother load of dismissal documents that we've talked about here. We've already gone through the motion to dismiss based on constitutional violations, 31 pages on that. We did a 34 page motion on the statutory violation saying that the indictment just doesn't match the law under 18 and the various U.S. codes. And then today we've got these two filings, one for the selective and vindictive prosecution and the other is a motion to strike the inflammatory statements that Jack Smith crammed inside of the original indictment. And so let's go through each one. Now the selective and vindictive prosecution motion also comes with a bunch of exhibits that we will unpack together as well. But this is where we'll start. 11 pages. This one's out of the Chutkin courtroom, the District of Columbia, the case, of course, United States of America versus Donald Trump. And this is President Trump's motion to dismiss for selective and vindictive prosecution. Saying, President Trump, Your Honor Chutkin, respectfully submits this motion to dismiss the charges on the basis of both selective and vindictive prosecution. The core conduct alleged in Jack Smith, Joe Biden's indictment relating to the presentation of the alternate electors has a historical basis that dates back to the 1800s and spans at least seven seven other elections. We've been doing this for a long time. There are no other prosecutions in American history related to these types of activities. The allegations in this indictment involve constitutionally authorized activities by President Trump as the commander in chief, as well as his speech and expressive conduct protected by the First Amendment. They say, given this context, it is no surprise that in the months following the 2020 election, senior government officials rejected an investigation of President Trump as unfounded and potentially unconstitutional. However, biased prosecutors pursued charges despite the evidence rather than based on it, with one prosecutor violating the DOJ rules and their ethical norms by forecasting the investigation in a television interview on 60 Minutes. Even the Attorney General Merrick Garland felt, quote, boxed in by the onslaught. Unable to address the criticism from President Trump through lawful means while facing public pressure from a House committee investigation led by Liz Cheney, not confined by the burden of proof or the same due process standards, for example, the same congressional investigation standards that failed to preserve a huge amount of exculpatory evidence because Liz Cheney and Kinzinger, they deleted the evidence, Benny Thompson did, before the House Administration Committee cut their hands on it. They say Joe Biden pressured the DOJ to pursue the nakedly political indictment in this case before the FBI had even opened an investigation. Now, less than a week before President Trump announced his candidacy for the presidency in 2024, Biden used the White White House itself to tell anyone listening that he was, quote, making sure the president himself does not become the next president again. Three days after President Trump formally announced his candidacy, special counsel Jack Smith was put in place as part of a flawed effort to insulate Joe Biden and his supporters from scrutiny of their obvious and illegal bias. He says, Trump's defense, now these actions, which are demonstrated inter alia by Biden's public statements and reports from the New York Times, as we'll see here, based on leaks from participants in the investigation, they require further inquiry and they require dismissal of the indictment. So in the entire history of this country, there's never been anything quite like this before. We have used alternate electors. We've had people challenge elections. We've had Democrats in 24 minutes, you know, on video posts saying that they thought that their prior elections that they lost were all stolen and rigged and they made objections on the floor of the Congress and so on. But here are the relevant facts. They say this is why this is selective and vindictive. They're targeting Trump only. In February and March of 2021, according to the Washington Post, the DOJ and the FBI rejected, rejected aggressive proposals by line prosecutors to target President Trump, including a wide ranging efforts to trace who had financed allegedly the claims of a stolen election and paid for the rally goers. They were encouraged to target the finances of Trump backers and examine slates of electors that Trump had submitted. The officials who rejected these proposals expressed concerns about First Amendment protected activities, uncomfortable analogies to other protest activities activities like BLM and Antifa and those, and the fact that investigating public figures demanded a high degree of confidence because even a probe that finds no crime can unfairly impugn them. However, nevertheless, following a March 2021 60 Minutes interview in which a then acting United States attorney expressed his quote personal belief that the evidence probably meets the elements of seditious conspiracy and those charges, the prosecutor heard from a close Justice Department ally that the attorney general and his deputies now felt boxed 
in to seditious conspiracy charges or to tough questions if they didn't bring them. And they're giving us this footnote here. Now, in November 2021, another prosecutor, who is now one of the senior special assistant special counsels who's assigned to this case, asked the FBI, that's probably Jay Barat, if I had to guess, asked the FBI to issue grand jury subpoenas targeting associates of President Trump. According to people familiar with the meeting, the proposal was met with flat rejection. No. Undeterred by the FBI's determination that the subpoenas were inappropriate, the prosecutor then pitched the same idea to the Postal Inspection Services. Around this time, according to a person familiar with the exchange, an investigator working for the House Committee investigating J6, quote, alerted the U.S. Attorney's Office about a few details about President Trump in connection with the House's investigation. Following this early coordination, the committee failed to preserve critical information about its activities, the interview materials, records identifying witnesses, and other intelligence and other law enforcement information as well. Amazing. So, in other words, they were forum shopping, all right? They were trying, these prosecutors were trying to get people to do things. U.S. attorneys were going first to the FBI. Can you help us and go investigate? No. Then they go to the Postal Service. How about you? Can you help us investigate it? No. And so they're all kind of catching wind on it. In April 2022, the New York Times reported that as recently as late last year, New York Times, Mr. Biden confided to his inner circle that he believed that President Trump was a threat to democracy and should be prosecuted. That's according to two people familiar with the comments, another news article. Exhibit two is what they're showing us. The article also attributed the following to Biden that he quote said, he has said privately that he wanted the attorney general to act less like a ponderous judge and more like a prosecutor who's willing to take decisive action. Go after Trump. That very same month, FBI reportedly opened an investigation into the elector scheme about 15 months after January 6th started. Why'd they wait so long? Well, the election was coming up and Joe Biden gave the order. On November 9th, Biden was much less private about this. In fact, at a press conference, Biden stated the following, quote, we just have to demonstrate that he, Trump, will not take power if we, if he does run. I'm making sure he, under legitimate efforts of our constitution, does not become the next president again, Joe Biden. So on November 15th, then Trump announced that he would run for a second term. Three days later, Biden's DOJ appointed Jack Smith to oversee the case. In the press release appointing Mr. Smith, the attorney general stated the appointment was necessary because of, quote, recent developments, including his announcement and the fact that he's going to run. Then on June 8th, they filed an indictment. Trump pleaded not guilty to those charges, and he argued on his true social account. He said, this is massive prosecutorial misconduct that's currently taking place in America. The weaponization of law enforcement cannot be allowed to happen. Now, following Trump's not guilty plea in Florida and his public criticisms, they then filed an indictment in this case based on unprecedented facts. They say Trump here, he was doing the duty of the official responsibility of the leader of this nation. And he was engaged in protective and expressive conduct, all protected by our first amendment. They say, your honor, there are two elements to a selective prosecution claim. The defendant must show that the challenge prosecution had a discriminatory effect and a discriminatory purpose. And they give us some rules about vindictive prosecution. They say here, the due process clause stops prosecutors from upping the ante by filing increased charges in order to retaliate against the defendant for exercising a legal right. Public statements by Biden and news reports show that there are prima facie cases of selective prosecution and vindictive prosecution here. In other words, judge, all you got to do is just look at Biden and their own statements, and it meets the elements of both of those, both selective and vindictive prosecutions. Let's see. They say, your honor, deranged thug Jack Smith and his prosecutors have behaved in a discriminatory and unconstitutionally selective fashion. Judge Chutkin, with respect to the selective prosecution, the relevant theory of this case is that it is illegal to dispute the outcome of an election and work with alternate electors. That's the theory. You cannot dispute the outcome of an election or use alternate electors. They say, well, that's obviously nuts. As we made clear in our motion to dismiss, which we incorporate here, the track record of similar unprosecuted efforts goes all the way back to at least 1800. And it includes at least seven other elections. So in light of this extensive history, it's not surprising that at least three Supreme Court justices have suggested that the Electoral Count Act contemplates Congress having to select among the conflicting states of electors. The Supreme Court has already said there are times when they've got to choose between the dueling slates. But what is surprising, says Trump's defense, and is likely to have an impermissibly discriminatory effect in this case and 2024, is the effort by Jack Smith's office to prosecute Trump based on his protected speech and the very same strategy. So why, if the court has said this was allowed previously, is Jack Smith relying on the opposite to bring this case? And they say, Your Honor, by 
by the way, this prosecution is also driven by an unconstitutional discriminatory purpose. Biden has said it himself. He's publicly stated his objective is to use the criminal justice system to incapacitate President Trump, his main political rival and the leading candidate in the election. No amount of quote, follow the evidence course correction by Attorney General Garland or Jack Smith, the special counsel can fix this. He's already said, and we already know that they were involved in coordination in a lot of these actions. They give us some case law about some other cases. And here they say, like, unlike other cases, after prosecutors who are now part of the prosecution team were rebuffed while forum shopping the inappropriate investigation around the FBI, will you do it? No. Postal Service, will you do it? No. Biden then told his advisors that Trump should be prosecuted. Biden said that to his people. He urged the attorney general to, quote, take decisive action. And he declared from the state dining room that he was, quote, making sure that Trump, quote, does not become the next president again. It all starts at the top. So what the government has done here is to suppress a viewpoint that it does not wish to hear. And so this is a case of selective prosecution. Now, parallel facts also support vindictive prosecution. So selective meaning you're picking one person out of everybody else inappropriately. Vindictive meaning you just have, you're not, you know, there isn't a bunch of other people. You're just picking somebody just to go get them. So this case urged by Biden, when many prosecutors and agents appropriately saw no basis for it, they're still going for it. It's a straightforward retaliatory response to Trump's decisions as commander in chief. He was exercising his constitutional rights to free speech. He has a right to petition for a redress of grievances, and he has a decision to run for office. And so without question, this is obviously a high profile prosecution with international ramifications. And it has a lot of potential motive to give rise to vindictive motive. And that motive here is manifest. We can see it. We can feel it. You can taste it. They are oozing disdain. Now, President Trump criticized the process and the results of 2020. He criticized Biden and his family during and before and after the election, including with their own misconduct and their malfeasance, in particular with regard to their Ukrainian oil and Burisma. I love this. They're dumping in all of Joe Biden's garbage with his son. All of their malfeasance, including Burisma, China, HK Limited, Russian oligarchs like Yelena Batarina, they're all there. They're trying to protect his own misconduct. Trump is now the leading candidate in the 2024 election and raises all kinds of concerns in that context as well. Likewise, Trump also criticized Jack Smith after charges were filed. And following those criticisms, Trump exercised his constitutional right to plead not guilty in Florida and prosecutors then filed additional charges again elsewhere. Boom, just hit him again. The record is more than sufficient to justify the presumption of vindictiveness. They say, Your Honor, at the very least, even if the special counsel's office responds to this and they say, no, we're really good people. We're just following justice. He says, they're trying to articulate a defense of their decision, even though there is none. He says, we still need a hearing. We got to have a hearing to give Trump the opportunity to demonstrate that their evidence is pretextual. Here, Biden's statements from the White House, the things that he has said that have come out of his own mouth and leaked accounts of flaws require additional fact finding and the court needs to hold a hearing. And so for the foregoing reasons, Trump submits that the indictment should be dismissed based on selective and vindictive prosecution. And if the court doesn't want to do that, you should hold a hearing to develop the record about the due process violations that Jack Smith and his deranged thug prosecutors have committed. So good filing. And I think that there are more exhibits here, but they're just basically the news articles, I think is what we're going to see. So here was one, June 19, 2023 updated. FBI resisted opening up a probe into Trump's role in January 6 for more than a year. Well, yeah, they needed to time it right, you know, and they actually needed an order, it sounds like, from Joe Biden, too. Merrick Garland was there. They've done a bunch of searches. Is Trump culpable? Maybe, right? So they're submitting this article. Here's another one, Exhibit 2. Garland faces growing pressure as January 6 investigation widens. Merrick Garland was sworn in, but the deliberative approach has become frustrating. As recently as last year, Mr. Biden confided to his inner circle that he thought Trump was a threat to democracy, and there it is, should be prosecuted to his inner circle. They say, and while the president has never communicated that to directly to Garland, he has said privately that he wants Garland to act like less than a ponderous judge and more like a prosecutor. So exhibit three is another one. Here, Trump, right, he made some comments. He criticizes them. Boom, he gets charged with crimes. Selective, vindictive. Same thing here. Crooked Joe Biden, he makes these posts. Boom, he gets hit with more charges. Targeting Joe Biden, targeting the deranged thugs, DOJ and FBI, and then they all spring into action to respond to try to take him out. And so that was just one portion of his filings. But we also had this second filing from Trump, which is a motion to 
strike some of the language out of the indictment. And they're saying that there is inflammatory language here that is not necessary. It's just there to inflame the language. So you see it's six pages. It's 1023 is when it was filed. The United States of America versus Donald Trump. Again, this is Trump's defense writing. They say, this indictment includes repeated references to actions of independent actors who are at the Capitol that have nothing to do with this case. The indictment does not charge Trump with responsibility for any of those actions. In fact, this indictment does not blame a January 6th speech by Trump even on those actions either. The indictment recognizes that these actions at the Capitol began before Trump had even finished speaking. And because the government has not charged Trump with responsibility for those actions, any allegations related to those actions are not relevant. They're prejudicial and they're inflammatory. And therefore, Your Honor, you should strike those sentences from the record. They say, Your Honor, the court does have the power under the rules to strike stuff. And you're allowed to do this when stuff might be prejudicial. Here's all the case law. They say courts in districts can do this and they have done it. And in fact, here, they should should do it also. They say the allegations of the activities at the Capitol on January 6 are not relevant to the charges against Trump. The indictment does not charge Trump with any J6 crimes. The New York Times reported, they said something noticeably absent with Jack Smith's indictment. He's charging Trump with multiple conspiracies, but something's missing. Any count that directly accused Trump of being responsible for violence. Stop short of charging Trump with anything like that. And also Trump didn't get charged with seditious conspiracies or anything either. So the defense says, yeah, that's exactly correct. The government has not charged President Trump with responsibility for January 6th stuff. The allegations in the indictment relating to the actions at the Capitol are not relevant. And so they should be removed. Now it's well settled. They say that prosecutors may not make comments designed to inflame passions or prejudices of the jury. And this applies to this indictment as well. And so in this indictment, we cannot have the jury get a bunch of stuff from extraneous allegations that aren't relevant to the actual facts this case. And courts have before done this. In fact, we had a China gate issue. We had an Iran Contra affair situation. And here it's the same. Now the public has a high awareness and strong views about January 6. Allegations in the indictment relating to these actions when Trump has not even been charged for them is highly prejudicial and inflammatory because members of the jury could wrongfully blame President Trump for those actions. And the government didn't charge him for those actions. And a former federal prosecutor has described the indictment's discussion of the events as the worst outrage in the indictment. Just saying it's waving the bloody shirt. So they say removing these allegations, the, the stuff that doesn't even apply, will substantially lessen the president, the prejudice to President Trump. So therefore, Your Honor, we ask you to remove them. They say the allegations about the J6 Capitol events are not relevant to anything here. They relate to a high profile issue. The public already knows about it. They've already got strong opinions about it. So if you include it, it's going to be prejudicial and inflammatory against Trump. And they're not relevant to the case. Therefore, you should strike, and he gives them the specific paragraphs, okay, 10D and 105 to 113 from the indictment. And this comes from Todd Blanche, John Loro, once again, on behalf of Donald Trump to Judge Chutkin out of Washington, D.C. And so that, my friends, is the final batch of motions from this current onslaught of motions to dismiss, and there will certainly be more of them to attend to. Now, in all likelihood, these are not going to be granted, right? Now, Trump has to etch in and mark in each one of these issues. And depending on what the judge's order looks like, right, he might have an opportunity to file an interlocutory appeal saying, that this impacts a collateral issue that is ripe for review now. But in all likelihood, they will be denied. And at the conclusion of the case, Trump will have a boatload of issues to appeal. Of course, my friends, we'll continue to cover it. That's provided that he loses this case. We'll see what happens. But I do hope you join us as we continue to unpack all of this. Follow the filings and more. Thank you for checking out robertgovea.com. We've got a daily newsletter there where we summarize all of these segments and send daily reports in after the show and the segments are over. So you never miss anything. robertgovea.com. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.